All right, today is October 4th, 2017. My name is Christopher Rich. I'm leading the interview today for the Veteran History Project. Assisting me is a local veteran from Williamsburg, Ohio, Mr. Roy Abrams, and also assisting me today is Mr. Andrew Hissett from the Milford Miami Township Branch. Today we have the pleasure to be interviewing Mr. Jason Block. And your date of birth, sir, for the record? 12-28-83. And uh, war and branch of service you were involved with? I was in the uh, U.S. Army, and I was involved in Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. And what was your highest rank you achieved while in active duty? Specialist E-4. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Jason, you said you grew up in Cincinnati. Where exactly did you grow up, and what was your what was your upbringing like? Um, I grew up in pretty much Milford, Ohio. Um, I grew up in a you know, small middle class family. Uh, both parents worked, and uh, both you know, I had one brother, um, so we were really active together. Uh, I grew up playing sports, hunting, fishing, loving the outdoors. Older brother um, or younger brother? A uh, younger brother. Yeah, he was uh, six years younger than me, but uh, we were pretty close. Um, what was your dad doing and mom doing? What, were they, what fields were they working in? My dad owned a small company called True Green. Uh, it was a landscape company, um, and then my mother worked for Leisure Lawn, which was another. Uh, more of the green industry, they weren't I guess. Competing, were they? No, no, <laughs> they, they weren't competing. Um, but uh, no, it was enough. I mean, it, you know, we, we had a good middle class family. Um, we were pretty close. Uh, most of my whole family is from the Cincinnati area, so uh, it's a good upbringing. Did you have any um, background with the military? Like, was grandparents, father, any of that? I'm glad you asked, yes. Um, a lot of my family dates back, I have records back um, to the Civil War. Um, I think I've got a family member that's pretty much served in most of the American wars. Uh, the closest that I would have, my father served as a Marine uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, his father served also in the Army um, overseas. Uh, his father served within the Korean War and World War One or World War Two. Um, that's probably about as far back as like I really know who came, but. Uh, my my family's always been a big supporter of of military, um, and and you know veterans in our service. So, um, did you graduate? What was your high school time like? Did you get involved with like what sorts of program? The ROTC. ROTC? Yeah. <laughs> no, not at the time. I had some friends that were involved in it, um, but I didn't. I mean, I, I loved playing army as a kid. You know, I would jump off of. Uh, things that you shouldn't jump off of with trash bags and think that, you know, I was jumping out of airplanes. And lo and behold, that, how that would later put me into the career I would be jumping out of planes. Um, but uh, just a, a lot of sports. I, I played a lot of sports and uh, did a lot of hunting with my father and my brother. What was your favorite sport? Baseball. What position? Catcher. Oh, Captain of play? the field, yeah. Okay, you played in high school. Yeah, I was, I was a catcher. Um, all throughout Milford teams, played with, with some competitive uh, traveling teams, uh, played for Milford High School um, on their JV and varsity team. Did you graduate from uh, uh, Milford? Milford? Yes. What year? 2002. Were you guys good? Were you two were going yeah. to learn? Yeah, I mean, it's a good team. Yeah. Cool. Did you know any? You can go through. I, I might know him. <laughs> I just uh, taking a period of time about that. All right. So you graduated in 2002. You said. Yeah. I know you didn't get into act, active duty until 2004. So what was happening? You were going to school. What was your plan? Working? Uh, I wanted to go to school, but uh, my parents were like, hey, you know, you need to pay for your own college. Um, so you know, I got some jobs. Um, I, I wasn't quite True sure. Green. <laughs> Actually, yes, I did work for True Green. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's funny you say that. Yeah. It was just I grew up. I grew up helping my dad out. I mean, all my summers was was working hard. Um, yeah. I saved my money to you know buy my first truck when I was seventeen. Yeah. I think it was seventeen. Um, so it was something I was really familiar with. So I ended up working. I worked uh, at a uh, at True Green. Mm -hmm. Worked for a couple of landscape companies. I mean, it's hit or miss. It's like wherever you can go and find the most work. Yeah. Um, worked at a, a gun local gun and bow shop. Um, you know, building bows and tweaking, you know, doing gun technician stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until late 2003 that I'm like, well, 
what, you know, I need to do something. Um, I wanted to actually go in because 9-11 happened during my senior year. And I wanted to go in, but I got a lot of pressure from the family to be like, hey, you know, I don't know about this one. Like, if you're going to do it, maybe pick something, uh, pick a branch that you might not end up in harm's way. Um, and I was totally like, no, that's not going to happen. Like, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, that's when 2003 came, and I finally made a decision with my parents, like, hey, you know, this is the best thing that I think that's going to be for me is, is going into the military. So what was it about the Army? How did that play? I talked to the Marines. I talked to the Navy. Um, I talked to the Army. And between, I guess, kind of my lifestyle of just being, you know, a rebel rouser, um, not a troublemaker, but, you know, I definitely pushed limits. I liked fast, you know, adrenaline. Um, I liked being out on, you know, shooting, you know, weapons and things. and. I was yeah. I talked to the recruiter, and he was like, "Well, let's let's take you, let's give you an ASVAB and take a test." And so I took a test, and they were like, "Well, you can qualify for you know these things." And I was like, "Well, what about anything with you know, like being in the infantry? What about jumping out of planes? What about different schools?" I'm like, well, your best bet's going to go probably in the infantry because you, I would get more of that training and more of that schools, um, you know, whether it's trade school or leadership courses, things like that. Um, so ultimately, I mean, it was the, the decision to be in the Army. Um, a couple of the other jobs that they wanted to offer uh, wouldn't, I, I guess they have a time limit or time period of like, hey, you know, we only have a certain amount of slots. Mm -hmm. And I could have been waiting for like six months. And I'm like, guys, like, I don't want to wait around. Like, we're getting ready to go into the new year, you know, going into spring. Let's go now. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, the infantry. And I was like, I'll take the infantry. And he's like, we can have you out of here in three weeks. I'm like, sign me up. Nice. So, signed up, um, and uh, I, I off to Fort Benning. I went. And Did I Operation went. Enduring Freedom began yet? What, yes. What time frame is that? Uh, 2002, maybe, right? Yeah, it was a little after unofficially, left, probably yeah. late 2001. Yeah. Um, but I mean, most by by the time that the, I think the media and everyone was putting it out, it was it was yeah. early 2002. I mean, I know we, the unit that I was in, um, as well as some of the other Army units uh, that I'm aware of, I know, you know, we're already bouncing inside of country, you know, in December of 2001 and then rolling into 2002. They were laying pretty, laying out the groundwork for, you know, conventional forces to come in. All right, so you knew you were going to do airborne. It still wasn't a guarantee you were going to be jumping out of airplanes, right? I mean, you still had right. to go through a lot of tests and you could still be airborne and not jump out of planes. Correct? Right. So how did Correct. that play out? Did you went to basic. What, went how to, are you making out as a soldier? Like? The basic training was great. Um, I, I, it, being a little bit older, I think, um, you know, because I, I went in, I was 20 years old. Okay, yeah. Being a little bit older, having some experience, um, I immediately kind of just stepped up inside of basic training. You know, so the, the, the other, they were kids, right? Right. Oh, okay. And the drill instructors, you know, picked that out very quickly. Like, okay, he's going to take charge of these guys. Cool. Um, so inside there, I performed you know, pretty well. My PT, my marching, my land nav, um, everything that I think growing up hunting and understand and learning woodsmanship and learning that stuff, I was applying inside of basic training. Um, so I was able to teach a lot of the guys how to, you know, at the rifle ranges, definitely. I mean, a lot of these guys had never fired a weapon yeah, or even let alone held one. What was yeah. your weapon of choice for basic training? Uh, probably the M4. No, no, that's a, it's a compact version of the M16. Oh, okay. Lighter gun. Yeah, lighter, smaller, more compatible for, you know, today's, you know, say, urban warfare zones and things. It's not like carrying broomsticks around, you know, in hallways. Um, so in basic training, I, I, I think I stepped up. Uh, even though I had it written in my contract that you can get it, it's no guarantee. You learn that once you get into the basic training. <laughs> This is, I mean, they're like, it's no guarantee. It doesn't matter if it's written in there. If you're not performing and you don't meet the qualifications and the standards um, that, is qual that is needed to be, you know, a paratrooper, then they'll cut you out. Yeah. So, uh, so you probably saw some 18-year-olds that just didn't make it. Right, you know, right. And then there were some in there that really stepped up that didn't get the option that they were like, hey, who wants to sign up for airborne school? 
um, and they let them go. And I actually went through airborne school with a lot of the same guys that I trained with, which I think was really important yeah. um, going into to the airborne school. Um, is you know we've already worked with these guys together. We've ran together. We've trained together. Yeah. Um, we've got another three weeks of jump school to get through, and then we're off to our own units. Yeah. Um, from there, you you kind of so in airborne school. Uh, you got to imagine. I mean, this is four. That was the one. Fourteen weeks. Or? Well, fourteen weeks was the basic training okay, plus right. the infantry training combined, um, which is all down at Fort Benning, Georgia, um, Sand Hill. And then uh, you go to jump school, and I remember the first time going there, because uh, I had watched, you know, be, prior to going in, I watched Black Hawk Down a lot, and uh, I believe the movies, yeah, Band of Brothers, uh, We Were Soldiers. So I remember them being airborne and seeing the jump towers, and I was like amazed at like the history of the jump towers down there. Um, so the uh, I get down there, this is the first time that pretty much in 14 weeks, you're kind of cut loose. Uh, you're allowed off post, you're allowed to wear civilian clothes. Um, I mean, I thought like, wow, 14 weeks, like here's freedom. Um, but it's not, it, it's very, you have to very, you have to really focus on what you're doing because I mean, if throughout the, the, base, right? yeah, you're still at the base. But I mean, each week of, of jump school is laid out to your first is just learning what it means to be a paratrooper, learning the history. Um, really kind of doing some exercises and things to prepare your legs for what you're about to go through. Um, your, your first and second week is literally just learning how to fall on the ground. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot of just, you know, beat up bruises up and down your body. Um, so being a catcher, that had to help you a little, right? I mean, you were already, your knees were already kind of... Yeah, I mean... I, I, right? right. Yeah. So uh, that could have. I mean, yeah. known, known, you know... Um, as you know, being able to squat, get up and down. Yeah, I, I mean, think it hurts you, that no, no, I, it, and especially for being you know a six foot guy. I, I mean, I know there's paratroopers that are bigger than I am, but you know we don't fall quite as easy as someone that's a little bit shorter than us. Um, so the second week is is kind of your you get on the towers, uh, you get on the the 34, 32 foot towers where you're actually jumping out of a mock plane. And you got some risers, and it's one of the funnest things. I mean, if you've ever been to zip lining, you like zip lining? Yeah. It's like a zip line. And uh, so the, you learn that, and then you go into your, your third week of where you actually begin your jumps. Yeah. Um, it gets a little bit more serious. Yeah, I That's remember. Where the zip line will be done. <laughs> I remember calling my mom uh, the night before. We were going out early in the morning. Our first jump is what they call a Hollywood jump. Um, it's just your, you know, your parachute and your reserve. There's no kit, no, you know, field Stop. kits or anything extra that you have to, to worry about. Yeah. And it's a day jump. And uh, I remember calling my mom the night before and be like, Mom, I'm jumping out of an airplane tomorrow. I just want to call and tell you I love you. Because you're just so jazzed to do it, but you're like, this is really not normal. How high up do you go? Um, our really first high. jump, I believe, was 12 or 1,300 feet. Okay. Um, that yeah, gives... Super no, no, and and that's I think the max for most of the static line jumps. Um, for you know, don't know about airborne school. They're static line jumps. It's not a free fall. Um, you're hooked up into a you know a plane, and when you jump out, it basically pulls for you. And you got about four seconds of free fall, and then you just you feel your chute open up and make sure that your canopies open up and there's no holes or it's not, you know what they call a cigar roll and twisted, um, and you're good to go. Um, yeah, so the, my first jump, uh, it, typically they would do it because my name, my last name starts with a B, they would do it in alphabetical order. Well, there was a, a guy in front of me, so I was, I was number two jumper. And first jump, I remember they opened up that door and I mean, my legs got wobbly, uh, my skin started to like crawl, like I got nervous. Um, but I was, I was really excited and I think that was the excitement that I was going through. The, uh, the, the, the jumper in front of me was messing around because when you're in there, I mean, you don't mess around with anything. Once you're hooked up, don't touch anything because you're, this is your first jump and they don't want you to, you know, they don't want you up there messing around with stuff. Well, the first jumper was messing around. So Why? that jump, wrong that jump master grabbed him, unhooked him and kicked him back to the back of the plane. <laughs> Did and you know this guy? Right? Yeah, yeah. I trained with him at, during basic training. So he had first jump. So I was next in line, and I and I was like even more of just like oh goodness, 
So he, the, and then what you do is the, the jump master will get you and the first jumper will actually step in front of the door. And I remember that first time of jumping and sitting right, or jumping right in front of that door and just watching all the trees go like this and just hearing the loud props. We were jumping out of C-130s, um, which is, you know, supplied through the Air Force. And uh, my first jump, uh, at, you know, up over a thousand feet, I remember just jumping out and hearing just the loudness of, you know, the props, uh, you know, just a And then I felt just a huge shock. And that's when, yeah, it, it just jolted me and I looked up and I had to, you know, kick a little bit because I was a little bit twisted. And I looked up and it opened up and so it's... you can control your twist a little. Yeah, you can, you pull and you just want to pull on your risers and make sure that, you know, you get untwisted. It wasn't a bad one. And I just looked up and uh, I was floating and I was looking down and the, the, the jump masters on the ground are just yelling at you, slip away and you all this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, they got bullhorns. And they're just yelling at you, and I'm up there, and the first thing that comes out of my mouth is I actually yelled. I was like, "Woo!" And they're like, "Shut up, you know, airborne," because it's just it was just the fun of the times. Um, and it, it was I learned that when you're up there, it's so quiet. I mean, it was absolutely quiet when you're floating down to the ground. It's it's super quiet, and. Uh, and then I landed, I hit the ground, and I looked around, and I'm like, nothing's broke. All right, this is fun. So That was a pretty good land, or did you have to land and roll? Or? I landed and rolled. Okay. Um, there's only been a couple of times that I've actually landed on my feet, and those were in drop zones at Fort Bragg that were full of sand. I mean, I literally just landed and bopped down on my knees. Um, then I've had some really bad landings. But, uh, no, after that, um, I, you know, I, I completed uh, all five jumps. Um, you have to complete all five jumps to the standards. Completed all five jumps. I got my airborne wings, and uh, during there, they they kind of give you a list of like, hey, what's your what's your wish list of kind of where you would like to go and utilize your airborne skills. I was like, well, 82nd. I knew the history of them. Um, I was like, I, I would number one want to go to the 82nd at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, number two I had on my list was the uh, 173rd Airborne out of Vincennes, Indi Italy. And then my last choice would have been the 101st Airborne um, because they weren't necessarily a whole airborne division anymore. Only a few units were, so you'd have to go through a lot of training to get selected into those units. Um, so I got 82nd. I, I was so happy. We were all celebrating. Um, I took a little block of leave. Uh, I think it was like 10 days. So it was coming up on, on uh, by that time, it was late summer, and it was coming up on, I believe, uh, Labor Day. And uh, I got my orders, and I ended up at Fort Bragg at the 82nd. All right, so what was Fort Bragg like? Tell us what your first duty assignment was. What were you doing down there? First duty assignment, um, I got attached uh, to uh, the 1st uh, to the 505th. Um, it's the uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment, 3rd uh, Combat Brigade Team of the 82nd Airborne. Um, a lot of history. Uh, the, first, the first, I guess, couple weeks in there is just learning the history of your unit who the Medal of Honor winners, what battles have they been in, what jumps. Um, my unit had, had made all five jumps during World War II. Um, so I, I was really proud of that history. I mean, that's a, I love the heritage that that comes with. Um, and then I, I guess it was probably about three weeks into just getting to my duty station, the, uh, some rumors started floating around the barracks that we could be getting deployed. Yeah. And we're like, well, yeah. Because a lot of these guys that were already at the unit had have just previous, they had just gotten back from Iraq, their first tour in Iraq, so they were all jazzed up. I mean, they were like, "Yeah, like none of them had been to Afghanistan yet." So, like, "Yeah, let's go to Afghanistan." Because you guys knew you were you were going for Saddam, wasn't that one of the main? Wasn't that kind of the main one of the main things? They were, they were well, that would have been in. that was Iraq, yeah. Okay. But we were, I mean, over there we were over there to, to suppress the Taliban, ideally. Oh yeah, and um, they're also looking for Bin Laden. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were still at Bin Laden was still at large at that time, yeah, that's right. um, so everybody was, was trying to you know yeah. curry him up into the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, so, lo and behold, we did. We uh, we we got our orders pretty quick. Um, so you were just in Fort Bragg a couple months. Probably. Not even that. I wasn't even there a month yet. I mean, I was at my unit. Um, I got the jump with them once. Oh, totally different kind of jump too than training. I mean, it was yeah, we were. This was full combat higher. jump. 
Uh, actually, much yeah. lower. So the combat they'll jumps, they'll equipment. they'll lower you down to six to eight hundred feet because Jeez. they want you at night because they want you down to the ground as soon as possible. Yeah. Believe me, you don't want to be flying around up there okay, as a target. True, yeah. So combat combat practice jumps are six to eight hundred. They might even go lower, but that's the safe to get you down to the ground. And that's pretty so, low for a plane. I mean, I would think at that distance, yeah. the plane could be sitting. So it depends, right? On right. What's safer with, for the plane and you guys? So. Uh, so the, how was that one? Did that feel different in your knees? Uh, yeah, it was, and and that was the first time that that we were actually doing a field exercise, where you know, because the eighty seconds were the guard for America, especially for the East Coast, but. Our main, the 80 seconds main job is to seize airfields. They'll drop us in an airfield, we secure it, and basically turn it into a US or allied airfields. I mean, that's what the 80 second was known for. Um, so we, we practiced that, um, pretty exciting. I mean, that was the first night, the first time that, you know, I got to look at, you know, airplanes going over with paratroopers under my night vision. Um, it, it was exciting. But I, I felt, I mean, like, I, these guys had trained together. They'd already went to war together. I and I think three other guys were new to the unit, yeah. um, which they call us cherries. Uh, How do they take to you guys? I mean, do they take you in, or is it you're kind of four on your own for a while? Or uh, no, they, t they take you in, but they ride you hard. Um, <laughs> Just making sure you know what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, making sure because, I mean, like they say, I mean, you could be downrange anytime soon. And when we did, I mean, it was game on. Like, it was, all right, now it's 100% focus. So when we got the orders, it was, we got the orders, and then within a week, um, I was landing in Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. When you do your training, taking on this, trying to overtake an airfield, mm -hmm. you obviously don't have active rounds. Like, what do you guys do? What is it? Four or five paint guns? Or is to, like, what do you do when you're preparing for that? Uh, preparing, we use mostly blanks. Um, we've got, you know, we got these devices that screw into the barrels of, of each one of the rifles from, you know, our individual rifles up to our big guns, and it's just shooting blanks. Okay. But, I mean, the other the people that are on the airfield, they try to act like they're the enemy. I mean, yeah, the Op 4, they, uh, they act like it. Um, there's multiple different training devices. I mean, that, you know, it, it just depends on if we have the supply, the logistics to it. Uh, the... A lot of times we just use the blanks with the blank firing adapter. Um, we would use a system called the Miles system, which is actually just a very better form of laser tag on a larger scale, uh, where you have a laser attached, and but you're still shooting blanks, and that laser fires. And then I, I think it was it was uh, 2005 is when we actually started first using the paint rounds which were you're actually firing rounds at each other um you know real you know casings but at the end of it, it's just this really hard little plastic paintball and it hurts bad um but it's about as realistic training as you can get because i mean if you right i mean you know if you're in there and you're in because we do these inside of shoot houses and inside of mock villages and say you catch one of those in the neck, or you catch one, you know, I caught one in the neck, I caught them on my knuckles before, yeah. and it, 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 you flinch. Right. But you're, you're stalling, I guess, the momentum of what could happen. But you act like a casualty. I mean, if you get hit with it, you are trained to, hey, okay, now you become a casualty. Wow. So, because you, you have to make the training as realistic as you can. Yeah. But nothing is realistic as, you know, what becomes. You just, you, you train for that. That way, when that, that fight or flight kicks in, it's more of a fight and not a flight. You don't want flighters. So how many would like make up your unit? Like you, know, like you talked about, the, there was four new cherry guys. How many of you were there like on a mission like this when you were training? Um, it depends if it was a platoon, a squad. Um, say, you know, my squad would be eight guys, eight to nine guys. Right. Um, platoon, you know, upwards of 30 guys, uh, maybe with some attachments. Uh, and then my company would be, you know, probably about 130 guys. Um, and that's probably, we trained at bigger levels, but we, wow. we really only worked with inside of our companies and our, and our platoons. All right, well, tell us about going to Afghanistan. So uh, Afghanistan got there. Um, it was a big wake-up call. Uh, you know, 
for anyone that, that's been to Afghanistan, uh, especially up in towards the mountains, or at least in Bagram and Norther, uh, there's a big elevation difference. Um, so the the training immediately, uh, we started doing PT, started carrying you know training with our packs on because they wanted to get us prepared because, I mean you you could be oh yeah yeah I mean it's I, a lot of us could feel it I mean you know they were trained in Iraq and then trained back at Fort Bragg, and even guys that were PT studs you know would feel it over there, huh. and I mean some of these guys would be out there smoking and joking and they'd be smoking a cigarette. Right before going on like runs, and I'm like, I'm over here dying. Like, but it doesn't take long to get you know acclimated to um, the weather. So, our mission in Afghanistan. What did you think physically of Afghanistan? I thought it was beautiful, to be honest. I, I did the mountains. Um, we couldn't get to a, because of Bagram and where it's at. It's like in a big bowl. Um, there's not really in order to get to places. We weren't really driving Humvees. Um, I think we did like two missions to just go out and visit some villages, but they were friendly, I mean, villages. Um, but a lot of our operations were done by um, aircraft. We would take um, uh, Schnooks, C40, CH-47 Schnooks, um, they would climb up over the mountains. And I remember the first time I came out of the, the Bagram, because in Bagram you're just looking at just mountains around you. So when you got up over that, you got to see all the valleys. I thought it was really pretty. Um, I've, I've never, I've never seen land like that. I mean, I've been to the Smoky Mountains, uh, but I've never been out west to see more of that rocky, big pines. Um, I didn't know that grass was there, <laughs> but yeah, there's grass and cornfields, and uh, it's 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 a fairly beautiful place. Um, I mean, if they could, uh, if you can make that a friendly place, a lot of people you could turn that place into some ski slopes. Um, after now visiting out in Colorado and South Dakota and seeing the mountains out there, it, it's fairly similar terrain and, and features. Um, but Afghanistan, it, it was good. Uh, that's when I got to, to learn how to actually go out and work and do work with uh, my fellow uh, squad members and team members. Um, we were there to... You didn't have to do a live job, right? During this no, time. no. No, I didn't get a mustard stain. Uh, mustard stain is... is <laughs> it's an expression for it's a little gold star um, signifying that you had jumped into a combat zone okay. or in the combat. Um, but uh, no jumps into it. So most of us stuff, most of our things were setting up OPs or op, you know outposts, small little outposts, Overwatch, um, visiting villages. Uh, we wanted to, the elections of, of October 2004. Uh, that was our mission. We were going over there to support the 25th Infantry Division. They needed more resources. They called in just my battalion. So this wasn't a division maneuver by any means. Um, it was only our battalion that went over. Uh, so kudos to us. I mean, we got that mission to, to that go over. 130 guys? Or that's yeah. Okay. With some attachments, you know, we, we always bring some attachments with us. Um, you know, medics, logistics, support units, mm -hmm. things like that. So, I mean, it grows a little bit, but yeah. primarily just 130 guys that are just prime infantry guys um, and then uh, so we got over there and uh, we were supporting the elections of 2004 for who had won um, Harmai Karzai well the 25th had gotten intel and a lot of the intel that had gotten was that the Taliban was going to be interrupting the polling sites and the voting sites and that's what they didn't want so um, we were basically there to keep the peace. We wanted to have a presence. We wanted the locals to feel safe that we were there to protect them um, and to make sure that you know none of the threats or actors or the Taliban were going to come in and, and uh, Did you have any do. pictures from Afghanistan that were taken away? Um, I do. This is one from Bagram right here. Um, Uh, just one with three guys. Uh, at that time, we didn't have, uh, I think I had a couple of throwaway cameras. I didn't have the GoPros that we have now and the digital cameras. I couldn't afford a digital camera at that time. Um, but uh, this, is, uh, this is myself, uh, my friend Andres, uh, who I served with there, and he actually left to, to join a, a small airborne unit up in Alaska. Um, and then this is uh, my friend Nick Arvanis. 
um, who was unfortunately killed uh, in Iraq. He was our first um, casualty uh, from our platoon um, in Iraq in 2006. And it's, uh, what's today, October 4th? October 6th, he was killed. So he was killed um, October 6, 2006. But um, but no, that I mean it, it was a good time over there. Uh, we we stayed over there for three to four months. Um, got into a little bit of combat action, uh, but it was it was fairly well. We didn't take any casualties there um, within our platoon. Uh, I felt good about being over there. I felt that you know we had made a difference, being able to help out some of the elections and things. Um, being able to see, you know, the, the purple dyed finger that's uh, infamous, you know, in some of the, the photos and some of the things that journalists write about. Um, but we got orders. We came back to, to Fort Bragg. Um, I got back in Fort Bragg in, in let's see, late 2005. Um, got back just for my 21st birthday, uh, which is December 28th. Uh, and uh, 2005 was my, my 21st birthday. So. Got back, hung out with the guys, do what all airborne paratroopers do. We all drink. Um, I don't know, but uh, I believe it was George Bush that said that AA stands for All Alcoholics or Alcoholics Anonymous uh, because our airborne PX sells more beer and alcohol than any other PX inside the country. Um, but uh, no, I came back. Um, it's, it's right back to speed up. I mean, we didn't take a, a big leave. We actually came back, um, and, you know, because for being what they call a DRF, a Division Readiness Force, there's only three combat brigades, and you've got to always be ready. We're on a rotation to where if something were to happen, we can be within, you know, 18 hours, wheels up and gone. Gotcha. So you weren't able to come home for a little bit. Yeah. Like so in, in that and just a lot of field exercises. Um, I ended up, I got in 2005, uh, that whole year, and, and in the 2006, um, I went through, I got my EIB, my Expert Infantry Badge, um, which is uh, a pretty prestigious award to infantrymen. A lot of men don't get a chance to get it because it takes a lot of money and time and logistics to put that together and put it on. Um, we were fortunate enough that, that we can do it. Um, yeah, and I mean, we just added it into our training um, cycles and uh, Luckily, all of our guys got it. I mean, that was a blast. Uh, Cause that's when you really get to go out and test it. I mean, you you train. It's it's on you know physical fitness, land navigation, um, medical, all the weapon systems. You have to know all the weapon systems. Um, calling in fire. Now, are you uh, talking about just your just your squad, or how how many are we talking about received this expert infantry badge? My whole company got them. I mean, all of us. I mean, we were trained to the T. You have to go and you have to qualify and shoot expert um, with your with your weapon. Yeah. I mean, so you go through all the weapons: your M4, your rifle grenade, uh, your 249 um, squad automatic weapon, your 240 Bravo, which is a heavier weapon. Um, it's a 30 caliber belt-fed weapon, um, up to the 50 caliber, um, you know, Browning machine gun and then the Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher. So you gotta be proficient in those, plus uh, the Javelins um, and the AT-4, which are rockets and uh, rocket-propelled uh, munitions, I guess you'd say. That's a team unit shoots those, or an individual can shoot those? An individual can. Oh, wow. okay, it's one of those big rockets. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, the one thing that always gets the people, and this is, I mean, so this is coming back to being a, a catcher. Uh, we were talking earlier about baseball. A lot of the people struggled because they never played baseball. Well, one of the, one of the, um, one of the, I can't say it, lanes, I guess you got to go through test, is throwing grenades. But it's a, it's a grenade. It's in a mock grenade, but it has just a little insert in it that's a little fuse and it pops mm -hmm. and you have to throw it 35 meters within a 15 pretty much a 15 meter circle they made them like baseballs intentionally right yeah, yeah. but people don't play baseball as much as they did in the world war ii times right Kids i mean it was americans uh, yeah everybody was out playing baseball and now they don't no yeah. so there was some guys that weren't used to throwing the right way right so <laughs> when we came up from that this is a good interview what i say 
ask if there's any baseball players in it. I raised my hand and he wanted me to throw this grenade and he says, now I want you to throw it over this barrier. Remember in three seconds or whatever, it's going off. And I came back and it went off and he said, I didn't mean for you to throw the damn thing over in the next county. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it to go far. <laughs> right? I wanted to go far. Um, so during that time, like we, I got to train a lot of the guys. I mean, we practice. I mean, because you get, you get no goes and goes, and you can only get a certain. I think you can only get two no, three no goes, and and you're disqualified. Um, so some of the guys, we were coming back and we were working in the evenings after training all day for it, just of, of just to practice after. because we wanted all of us to to get the EIB. What you practice um, with? Grenades or baseballs? <laughs> well, we, we got the mock grenades, um, just not with that with the fuses in them. Yeah. But we would just practice. I mean, all it was is literally. Baseball, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's it's heavier than a baseball. I don't know the specifics, but it's it's literally grip and then form. I mean, uh, I saw some people that were just and uh, I and I got them and and. But I, I felt really good. I was able to get some of my teammates through by training them through, you know, what what I had learned um, when I was a young guy of being a baseball player. I mean, I used to be able to come up and throw to second base really, really hard. Sitting um, down or standing up? Sitting down or standing up, whatever. If he had a jump on me sitting down, if I could get up and throw, if I could stand up and I knew that I had him, I'd stand up and just throw it down there. Who's rated the best baseball catcher of all time? Johnny Bench. <laughs> All right, so you were at Fort Bragg a little bit, and then you got the orders to go to Iraq, right? How long was that after? Uh, that that came around. We got the orders, I believe, in June, June or July of 2006. So you uh, were there six or seven months, right? Yeah. Get yeah, and I had a lot of intensive training cycles. I got the train and go down to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Oof, that place is... I mean, if I was thought, I, I, I mean, I've never been in Vietnam, but for all the stories that I hear of it, if you were going to train to go there, that would be the place to go. Because it's just you individually or the company? No, no, it's, it's our company. My bad. No, it's, it's our company goes down. Um, actually, our whole battalion went down there to train because uh, we were training as a, as a brigade. So the whole battalion goes down there in a cycle. Um, and, I mean, they have some, some mock-up mount training down there, some, you know, which is urban warfare training mm -hmm. but down there i mean it was more of jungle warfare training i mean mosquitoes bugs uh swamps trees i mean you, you, yeah you, you can't you can't see there's nothing there that said anything about mountains or desert <laughs> <That's true. laughs> no training for mountains or deserts um you thought that they would have shipped us out to at least nevada or california to some of those yeah, the know. training out there but um so we went through some of that training um, I was actually, I signed up, I was able to complete the uh, EMT and get nationally registered as an EMT basic. Um, they did that for 11 soldiers. Uh, you basically signed up, they look at your performance over your, like, who's up for promotions and this and that. And I was up for coming in for specialists, so they're like, hey, based on your scores and your performance as a soldier, we think that you should go to EMT school. Now, this was a, a a quick six-week intensive off base at the local Fayetteville Tec Technical Community College. Um, got to wear civilian clothes every day. That was nice. I mean, when you're wearing BDUs and DCUs and ACUs every day, uh, you know, pretty much every single day of your kind life. Of yeah, it, it kind of felt right? nice. Yeah, it was like, yeah, <laughs> definitely. It just, it, it felt different. It felt like I was off the post. You'd come back and all the guys would rag on you and be like, oh, what have you guys been doing all day? And they're coming back from like field exercises and they're like, here, clean my weapon. And I'm like, whatever. So um, I felt good because it, it added, uh, it added a, another skill um, that I could do, that I could use, yeah, later in life. But also going in, I mean, everybody in the unit is trained as in combat life saving. Now that's just basic combat life saving. Like they tourniquets, tourniquets okay. plug in holes, okay. open up clean airways, things like that. They EMT was a little bit more advanced than that. Um, how to treat certain injuries, um, not just you know combat injuries, other different things, um, and it just prepared us because I ended up carrying the medic bag a couple of times. 
uh, which was a lot more nerve wracking than carrying a weapon full time and knowing you're infantry guy. When you're when you're knowing that you're carrying the medic bag, that's a whole different responsibility than. I mean, every day you're number one. You're an infantry guy first over there. Then you're a medic, and you've only got your own personal gear, and you can use you know your own personal gear on yourself, or you use your buddies in the case on them. But when you're carrying that medic pack, uh, your the whole all your responsibilities change. Um, so it came in handy. Um, so in between that time, we got all trained up, and then we got orders. I believe it was that June or July. Uh, so we intensified the training a little bit more. Um, it was hot. Fort Bragg is really hot um, in the summer, and they made it even hotter because we didn't know. You know, a lot of us by that time, you know, some of the guys that had been to Iraq back in '04 had gotten out, and we had gotten a whole new group of guys in. So it was a lot of fresh people. The only ones that had really been deployed had been the guys that had went on the Afghanistan trip. Now there was a couple from Iraq that stuck around. But these were a, a, a group of new Joes, um, and so we had to acclimate them. I mean, we didn't. None of them knew that you know it's 130 degrees over there. Uh, so, but it's dry heat, whereas 100, you know, 100 degrees feels like in, in Fort Bragg. It's humid. I mean, all the pine trees and the sand and is clay. It a similar difference. I mean, can you feel that? Like 100 is more similar to 130. Or yeah. It's totally different because of the no humidity. Well, the humidity here, like if it's 100, like 130 over there feels like maybe 98 to 100 oh, here. Okay. Um, yeah. But you would train, I mean, we would put our more gear on, yeah. more layers to just kind of get us used to what that's going to feel like. Um, so then uh, we got our the orders. Um, we prepped and we left for Iraq in like the middle of August. So what was your first reaction to Iraq? Totally different than Afghanistan. Oh, um, dusty, flat, uh, hot, really hot. Um, we were on a, a small base called Fob Summerall. Uh, it was established in, I believe, 2004. Um, so there had been a quite a bit of units, but it's a small, real small base. This wasn't a big, big base, big camp, nice big chow halls or anything. Um, we had to man our own security. Uh, there was, uh, we were actually, we took it over for the uh, 101st Airborne, uh, who sustained quite a bit of casualties. So that was a wake up. Uh, when we got there, they don't want to tell you that, you know, obviously until you get into country, but uh, they had, they were taking, they had took a lot of casualties. So that rained on our mind right Did away. Did they tell you how, or was it just? Sniper fire and uh, IEDs. So just driving around with the... Yeah. How would you guys get around? Was it Humvees, or what was your mode of transport? Humvees. Fully up armored Humvees. Um, a lot of them were just big, huge, I mean, heavy weights. I mean, uh, I, feel ba I felt bad for our... our motor pool and all the mechanics having to repair all, everything. I mean, the trucks at that time necessarily weren't built to sustain that much weight that they were adding on to the armor. So it was a lot, of, uh, a lot of work for those guys, a lot of work for us if we blew out tires. I mean, we had no jacks that could jack up a truck that has got that much armor on it. They were phasing all that stuff out and giving it to the Iraqi army at that time because they were coming in with the new rhinos and bearcats and like all the, the mine resistant vehicles that are V-shaped at the bottom. Because you, I mean, you got a flat truck and you hit a landmine or ID and I mean, it just flips that thing over or it just, you know, it, it, it doesn't, there's no way for that blast to go. It just elevates that. So they learned that and they were like, well, we need to make vehicles sit up a little bit higher, V the bottom of them, uh, make sure the blast goes outward and not straight upward. What were you guys gonna be doing over there? Did you yeah, so we're in a town of Baji. Uh, it's the population's about 150,000. Um, it was just my battalion there. Uh, my it's down to what, 60 or 70? So the the battalion the battalion total size is close to 800 to 1,000. Um, now not all of them are combat troops. A lot of them are you know stay on the base. Um, there was a lot of other cities. Baji, Iraq, is the second largest oil refinery. Um, north of Dakrit, 
um, south of Missoula. It's in between, in between Decret, which is Saddam's hometown, and uh, Missoula, right on Highway 1, which we're, we know is Tampa. Um, everyone calls it Tampa over there. Very dangerous highway, but uh, it's, you know, basically runs all the way from Kuwait all the way up north uh, past Missoula. And uh, our job was to lock down the city of Baji to be able to support the oil refineries. Um, there was a small outpost outside of the towns that the Alpha Company took, uh, Bravo Company, I was Charlie Company, um, and Charlie Company got the mission to basically do, uh, take over the city. Now this is my, we're probably running around 130 guys and we were in, we had to be in control of a population of 150,000. Um, so yeah, it's a city. Um, at first, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we had lost, our, our first casualty was our um, Iraqi interpreter um, in, a, in landmines, a Humvee, you know. We took some, we didn't take uh, KIAs, but we took some injuries and wounded. Um, but the first casualty was pretty much our first large foot patrol out into the city. Um, and uh, that was with Nick Arvanis. He was in a different platoon. We were all out operating together, and uh, he was actually in a tower of uh, the police station where we would act later um, take over that police station later on um, in the year. And uh, he was up in a tower just doing some overwatch and uh, was hit by a sniper. So that was the first casualty. Um, I remember listening to it, uh, coming over the radios, and just like, oh, wow, okay. Now we gotta go, everybody intensifies, we gotta go hunt this guy down, and it's like, man, it's getting dark. Like, we're in a town of 150,000 and we just got here. Um, that we, we've, we had done a couple of just kind of, you know, right seat rides out there. We patrolled the trucks, got outside, said hello. But this was the first time that we actually parked the trucks, got out in boots on the ground, just walking the cities. Just trying to learn, meet some people, find out, hey, if we walk into this portion of the town, does everybody go away? Or do they all come out and greet us? Like, who's friendly and who's foe? Um, but, uh, was that always hard to determine? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, you don't know who's friendly, who's foe. Everybody, I, I learned everybody over there tells you one thing and it's, there's another and they always blame the, the person, you know, the, their neighbor down the street, oh, he did it or, um, did you guys remember if you got the guy? Do you think you got the sniper? Uh, uh to be honest, I don't know. We hunted him down because Arvanis uh, wasn't the uh, uh, the only one that this guy got, and we had intel on him. Um, the special forces team that was attached with us, uh, the U.S. Army special forces team, um, had good intel on him, and uh, we couldn't. I mean, we thought we had him uh, a couple of times. So uh, we roll in um, November. Uh, November was a, a tough time. We actually lost our command sergeant major of our battalion, which is a huge blow. Um, to lost him to a, 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 a triple stack landmine, and uh, he that, that that was just a big blow. I mean that that's yeah. two months into the deployment, we lost our Vanis. We had lost another member from the battalion, and when, then we lost our command sergeant major of our battalion. Um, and then we're going into the winter months. So. so took over. Um, another gentleman that, that came from a different unit took over. I think he was like next in line. Yeah, well, um, he wasn't with you guys anymore, right? Right. I mean, the, the, the Command Sergeant Major Caldwell was like a really good guy. Been in the military a long time. He had his Ranger tab. He was squared away. Um, he didn't take crap, but he also didn't treat you like crap. Um, you, you know, so you... It affected all you guys on a personal level. Yeah, a little bit it did. I mean, it, that's a tough blow when you, because you, you, you see, you think of your commander and your command sergeant major as like, Was it just you know, unlucky times. or was he just happened to be the one or could it have been any, like it was multiple people? It, it was that, it was that gun truck that, that took it. He was in a truck and coming back in a convoy and it just happened to wow, run over that, that mines and yeah, I mean, it's just unlucky. Yeah, because he could have easily, you were in that same. No, I wasn't in that convoy. I had actually just taken post. But other people made it fine through the convoy. Mm -hmm. It's just one truck. Yeah. Man, that's unlucky of all the trucks. You know, right. I hate, to, I hate to say that, but he had an important role. You know, all 
Right. But it's, uh, we, I mean, we went in, we, most of the time we were operating off the base. We would go do night raids, night, you know, look for, you know, high value targets at night. We would gain intel. We'd have teams out there during the day, during watch, and then, you know, teams at night doing um, any of the, the missions. And it just got to the point to where our trucks, they were in place in too many IEDs, too many mines, too many sniper attacks, and this was happening all over the country. Now you gotta understand that this is 2006, 2007. 2006 was a very, very violent year. Um, out of all of Iraq, 2005, 2006 was really bad. Um, so 2006, you know, whoever's in charge, I think it was uh, General Petraeus at the time, uh, was in charge of the country. Uh, he was the commander of, you know, all the, the armed forces in the country. And uh, he decided that, hey, you know, we need to pull all of our guys off of the bases and they need to establish a joint security station inside the cities. So that's what we did. We went out, we took over the Iraqi police station and uh, we fortified and built our compound out there. A lot of work. Um, and uh, we, but I think we, we had to do that because they, we needed to be out there patrolling, and that turned into basically us patrolling almost nearly 24 hours a day. Um, you know, when you're running, if you got a platoon out there and you got three to four squads in it, you've got them out there for, say, six hours patrolling, one, uh, or one squad sleeping, and then one squad pulling security, you rotate those. So you make a presence, and then your platoon would sit out there for two or three weeks, and then another platoon from our battalion would come out and replace us. We'd go back, refit, so um, eat the food. Would deter any, right. Anything because they would see you guys always right. on, on alert. Right. right. We well that it didn't seem to be working. Right. It so did, and we and we really wanted the we wanted uh, to kind of gain the trust of the locals. Um, we had gotten a unit of Iraqi army. They moved out with us, so it was the Iraqi army, the. Uh, the Iraqi police, and then us all living in a compound together. Um, so I thought that, you know, the more that they could put us together, we could learn how it's a lot better. Because, you know, when you got two forces that have language barriers and cultural barriers, and they're just like, hey, you rally up, you guys are going to go. Because they weren't allowed onto the, the FOB Summerall on the big on the main base. So we would meet them outside the wire and go with them. and. We, we had to gain their trust and they wanted to they needed to see how we operate because yeah. we were going to train them our job we didn't want to be over in iraq forever yeah. i mean it was their job but we needed to train them because they didn't have an army their army was decimated yeah. or they just you know threw up the white flags and quit so we needed some we needed to train the iraqi army yeah. and how to fight yeah. um and how to work with u.s forces uh which is totally different so um so then comes uh, 2007, or yeah, 2007. Uh, we implemented a program where we're, I'd, I'd never seen it before, never even heard of it, and where we got iris scans. I mean, we were, we basically badged. We we did a raid on the entire city. We pushed up and built a massive perimeter around the whole city. I mean, we blocked it in and raided the whole city and we gave warning to say hey if you're a threat and you're a bad guy either come now or leave because this town these the people don't want to deal with it because they're getting caught up in you know the crossfire mm -hmm. um so we did that and basically once we once we went through we we cleared the whole city it was like a week long um we started doing this large badge process to where we were badging and recording all of the civilians there I mean, that's iris scans, computer data, giving them badges, basically ID cards. So if, you know, if they were going to be stopped by a uh, U.S. or ally force, you can just be like, okay, here's my ID card. It's not like, okay, here's your papers. Then we've got to find an interpreter to even tell us what the paper says. But on the paper, I mean, it's just a, a printed out, you know, crappy printer version. You can't really tell who it is. Um, so we did that project throughout January um, and then uh, January com came and that's when uh, I lost a, a good friend um, at the end of January uh, we were doing a, just a mission 
Um, we, we worked all through night. We made a stop inside of the middle of the town. They called it, uh, it's pretty much where all the markets is, called it RPG Alley. Uh, it was a nickname that we, you know, us gave it. I'm sure the soldiers that came before us gave it that alley. We always seemed to get shot at by RPGs in this alleyway. Um, and we were just stagnant for too long. Uh, his name was uh, William, William M. Sigwa. Uh, he was a squad leader for one of the, at this time, I, I was a weapons team leader. So I was on the gun trucks. Um, man, manning, you know, my, my weapon, in, which was a Mark 19. And uh, William had actually, he was the uh, NCO in charge of the truck. Well, we had been sitting in those trucks for nearly six hours all night. So, you know, we got to get out, at least move our legs around, stretch out, yeah. swap out, you know, take our own individual weapon, you know, go do whatever we need to do, but get some fresh eyes up in there. Well, the morning time comes and uh, he decided to take the seat for one of my gun guys, one of one of my uh, private team gun guys. So he t he takes his seat, and I mean I think he was up there for maybe half an hour, and we just hear a snap, and that's when you know when. Uh, Sniper. Yeah, that's when you know a bullet you know just broken your sound barrier, just went past you, and uh, that was yeah that was the first shot of a, a large firefight. Um, to, because it wasn't only him, like it was coordinated because we had sat there and they started placing guns around us and we couldn't see them. I mean, these guys, they roll up in cars, they roll up on motorbikes. Um, we didn't, we couldn't identify who the sniper was, but uh, so we just... So you thought you guys, you blamed yourself because you thought you guys stayed there too long? Yeah. Well, could you if you were supposed to be more... <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't, don't, for, I, I can play quarterback now because yeah. don't just sit stagnant in your gun trucks. like. And I mean, we thought we had it covered. We had a roving patrol moving around, but as this patrol moved here, they were moving like, if you're moving around a piece of pie, or if you're looking at a compass, as our guys move south, they move north. And um, so they just, they, you guys went yeah, they just, they coordinated an attack on us. And we were just sitting, we were sitting ducks. So we took that, we took that pretty seriously. Coming back out of though, right? Yeah. Once you saw. Oh yeah. Um, so that, them, that, yeah, we got a couple. That was uh, that was really heartbreaking. Because um, it was in your truck, right? Yeah, and it was just uh, we were good friends. I mean, I'd served with Will or Sigwa um, in Afghanistan as well. Um, he's one of the guys that that I served with there. And then uh, so that that was pretty hard. Did My he mom. Have a chance or it was he no, no, nah, nah, it, it, it was incident. Yeah. Um, well, Right. So throughout that, um, after that, I mean, we took uh, our whole unit, our whole battalion as a whole, took, you know, a lot of IEDs, a lot of casualties from just combat sustained wounds. Um, comes into our big day. It's actually, um, you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, if you type in 1-505 uh, Beijing, Iraq, VBID, uh, we, it was, I believe in June, uh, early June, uh, it was the morning. 2007. Yeah, June 2007. Uh, my platoon was out at our JSS, at JSS, and we had named it JSS Arvanus Sigwa, named after you know the two guys that we had lost from from our company at that time. Uh, and we were coming off. We were getting. We had actually. We were getting ready to do a rotation. You know, like I said, we do eight-hour rotations. Um, you know, between eight hours of pulling security on the rooftops and, and manning our compound, eight hours of sleeping, eating, cleaning your weapon, writing emails, whatever you could do, uh, eight hours of patrols being out in the city. So this is early in the morning. And I was up in a, and I didn't bring a picture with me, I guess I should have, but um, we were up in this, the, I mean, it, it, over there, the house is the, the IP station, it looked like a, a man, it was a mansion. I mean, it had big, beautiful pillars. It's all big stone marble outside walls. Uh, I was up in this gun nest um, with one of my guys, uh, James, uh, Jamie Sabasio, and uh, we were just sitting up there, you know, just shooting the crap. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I mean, just a, just sitting in here, just a large explosion, just right off the right side of us. And it threw both of us against each other inside. We're inside this like basically like a, a sandbag bee hut, um, you know, with little windows in it, so we can look out. 
and uh, it threw us both, and, and that was the start of about a three-hour firefight. Um, that was a very well-organized attack. Um, what it did is we found out uh, they basically came and, and used a dump truck full of explosives to breach our wall, and it, it, it leveled the IP station, it leveled the Iraqi station. Our building was still standing, um, but you gotta understand, I mean, we're in a compound that's probably no bigger than this parking lot. It, it's not a big base, it's very small. I mean, you're right there hands-on with the people. Uh, and all of us were on the rooftop and immediately over, like, everybody get to the roof because we were just getting shots. I mean, rockets, you know, rockets going over, little missiles going over top of our thing, um, sandbags. I mean, they were beating off the sandbags, and so you knew that, that was... Thing wasn't going to make it. No, it was, it was an organized attack. They blew one hole, and, and then one of our guys it was able to get... There was a second dump truck coming up, and they were going to blow the other side of the wall. And then all we saw were all just enemy fighters coming out through all the alleyways and running, and I mean, it was mad chaos. Uh, but it was like a really organized chaos. So how did you guys get the other dump truck? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, we stopped him. Um, the EOD came out and looked inside of that dump truck, and lo and behold, same amount of explosives. It was like 1,500 pounds of, of explosives. You guys got the driver before you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were able to, you know, I don't know who it was on top. I mean, when there's a lot of people trying to stop a vehicle, it's not like, hey, I did that. Um, I mean, it was a team effort. Did you get into the building, the two of you? No, we were stayed up on that rooftop. Okay. Um, so we stayed up on that rooftop, and uh, I went uh, what they call black or Winchester on ammo. Um, I mean, that's 210 rounds of ammo. Like, I was done. So we didn't have any more ammo cans up there. Well. Most of the forces, that was just this little bee hut that set over on this side, and it was dangerous. So the main rooftop, we came down and ended up just taking up more ammo. So I didn't go up on that rooftop until probably about another hour into the, the, the firefight. And because down, down at the bottom, we only had two medics. Our medic station was completely blown apart because it, it wasn't the, the shrapnel or explosion that, that wounded a lot of us. It was the pressure. If anyone that's ever been in a large explosion, it's the the, bond, the pressure that comes off of that. I mean, it, it it threw nails, it threw nails out of the bunk beds that we made because we had made our own bunk beds all inside the building. It threw nails out the opposite way. I mean, that's how strong that pressure was. Um, I've actually got a picture um, at the house where if anyone that's had, had seen a 50 cal Maldeuce barrel, I mean, that's a solid barrel that big. I've got a picture of it twisted, and that gun truck was sitting right outside, but it was facing up like this, and that um, the first the first truck the dump truck pulled in, and because of the pressure, it had twisted that 50 cal barrel. Shrapnel or no other nothing hit it besides the energy. So that was um, the energy when you guys were thrown. Yeah, into when the we were thrown. Yeah. Like you were football thrown. Like oh yeah. You hit hard. Yeah, I mean, it felt like a truck hit us. We were just both slammed up against, I mean, both of us, uh, really bad headaches. I mean, I think I got sick uh, at the time, I mean, just because everything was hurting. Um, but it was a lot worse down at the bottom. Uh, behold, I mean, the IP station had basically just poof, straight free fall to the ground. Um, a lot of the IPs and IAs were hurt. We had some wounded. Um, because all the glass inside the building were shattered. There was stuff throwing everywhere. People were stepping on nails. So the, uh, our chow hall and our, uh, our, med, you know, our med station was all just blown, destroyed. We, we built all this stuff you know, out of plywood, and it was just destroyed. I mean, there was medical supplies laid all over the courtyard, um, and I got grabbed and said, hey, you know, we need you to stay down here and attend to some of the medical stuff. Um, I'd like to be able to find out the National Guard guy because we did have a National Guard team that was just strictly there working. They're a military police team that was working with the Iraqi police. We worked with the Iraqi army. They worked with the Iraqi police. Um, the, he sustained a wound to his foot that was very bad. And I, 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 I yeah, I, I mean, I became, I was the first one to grab him and carry him out and basically put his foot back together. You think he made it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know he made it. Yeah, he was good. I mean, he thanked me once there, you know, on base when I saw him. But he was pretty much, uh, 
he was pretty much done for the year, I put it that way, um, when it came. I don't know if he got out of the, the National Guard. I'd like to be able to find him someday. But, so we got um, about 10 minutes left. Yeah. I just want to make sure that you get to use all your time. Um, is there anything else you want to share there before we go, before you go back into reserve time? Because we haven't even covered that. Oh, National yeah. Guard. So the, the rest of my time, um, you know, we, we ended up spending 15 months in Iraq. Um, took you know a little bit more casualties till then. Uh, by that time, that 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 uh, that deployment took a toll on me. Um, I was ready to get out. I you think I was like friends. 24 at the time. I mean, you lost oh yeah. Two close friends, but yeah, total we lost a total. Friends. We lost uh, a total of 12 so um, just out of my unit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Shit. Um, so we came back, um, party pretty hard. Um, actually, at the I, I do want to say this for um, whoever says this, but definitely for my son Prescott and, and Pearson. Um, while I was over there, I did get to take a block of leave. During that block of leave, it was two weeks, and that's where I met my current wife right now, yeah. um, through my Aunt Lynn. Uh, she worked with my Aunt Lynn, but uh, I came home for a week, and that was the first time. We, we went to high school together, but we didn't know each other. Um, she was two years ahead of me. I didn't know her. She was a popular cheerleader. Milford was that yeah. thick. I guess yeah. Milford has gotten thick. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, she was two years ahead of me. I didn't know who she was. Yeah. Um, but we did meet, and uh, ever since then, we've been together. So, um, it's one of those you knew you were going to be with her. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, even when I went back over and went through all this, um, she still was with me. So now we have two beautiful sons, Pearson and Prescott. Um, but I, I definitely wanted to put that in there. Yeah. Um, my uh, son-in-law. Yeah, I know the Beckers. You don't know the first name, do you? I'll have to ask Jackie. Was She'll probably know him. Kyle knows Becker? Kyle Becker, yeah. Okay. There's a whole group of Beckers. He's in Australia now. Oh, man. He's got two great grandkids that I've never seen. <laughs> so what made you come back and get into the reserves? How did that play out? Uh, because some of the guys at the time, um, they were still needing a lot of troops. And I, I had heard rumors, and I'd actually met guys that had gotten out of the military total and didn't sign up for the reserves. They just kind of wanted to play out the rest of their eight years on what they call IRR, um, which is you know just a reserve readiness. Yeah. Well, they were going off and doing their things and getting called back up. So I didn't want to go and start school or a job or go back home and then randomly end up in a unit somehow, get called up out of nowhere, because I would have went. I wouldn't be, you know, I'm not going to take this. Like, I'm going to serve my country. Um, so to kind of, I, I, but this time I'd realized I wanted to get out. Um, I ran into the recruiters. They said, hey. You hadn't had a child yet, though, right? No, no. You guys weren't even married. No, we weren't even married. We were just dating. Um, I decided I wanted to come back to Ohio because she's here with her family. And I just thought, you know, hey, you know, this is best if I come back to there and assimilate into her family. I'll have support. Um, so I talked to the recruiter. I talked to the recruiter, and I said that, hey, I'll, uh, you know, what, what type of packages can you give me? And he said, well, we can put you in an infantry unit in Ohio. I'll knock off two years of the rest of the four years you owed because this I'd only done four years reserve. And during those two years, you're locked in stateside. So if they go into deployment, you don't have to go. You can be on rear detachment. I was like, well, sure, sign me up. I'll go do that while I go through school. I mean, I, I love the military, but it, uh, I needed to come back here, and I wanted to go to school. Um, you, were dis you were discharged from here when that happened. Right, right. Be right. Before we run out of a tape, I want to know your thoughts on this. What would you think, in the absence of wartime, of a mandatory draft for all 18-year-old boys and girls to give Uncle Sam service, something like maybe the Peace Corps or whatever, so they can get away from home, get their head screwed on right, and get a little discipline? What would you think of that? I think everybody should get a chance to go serve their country, especially if they want to go to school or learn a trade. I mean, even if a wartime or not, I know, you know, there's other countries that it's mandatory for people yeah. to serve the military. Did but you take advantage of that when you got back? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I did. Um, so I used the, uh, the, the post-9-11 GI Bill. Um, I went to Northern Kentucky University where I got a bachelor's degree in history and a bachelor's degree a minor, with a minor in philosophy. So, yeah, I took full advantage of it. 
Um, I was the first in my family to graduate college. So it, it was a big accomplishment for me. Um, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that had I tried to work through school, knowing that what some of these kids go through with debt, and that's, you know, to your point, the, the debt that, you know, some of these, these young guys are going, young guys and girls are going through, you know, my school was 100% paid for. Books, room and board. And is that when um, you got married, when you got back? You yeah, I got, I actually, I got married uh, September 11th, 2010. Um, and then uh, I was engaged July 4th, 2009, uh, married September 11th, 2010. My first son was born July 4th, 2014. No, it's not playing. It's just my life. In 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 her family, she's a daughter of the revolution. Um, so she and she runs deep into to that ancestry stuff and genealogy. I mean, she's got records of all the stuff. And her family. What's her name? Um, her name is uh, Jackie Heller Block, um, and she's she's from the uh, Milford area. Well, we've just got a few more minutes. I just sure. To, um, what are you doing career-wise now? I know you talked about it briefly at the beginning, but I don't know if I had that on camera. Uh, so right now I do um, business development, partnership development for, um, it's a state uh, public agency called uh, Hamilton Claremont Cooperative. Um, my role is to kind of teach uh, local government agencies, uh, departments, about services that are open to them, um, pretty much share services. Uh, it, I'm new to this role. I've only been in it for three months. Um, prior to that, I was a recruiter, uh, a technology recruiter for uh, a company called Tech Systems. And that's, that's when I graduated college. Um, I immediately like got picked up by a buddy that worked there, and that was like a great two years of just like learning about technology. So that's like my interest now is is history and, and technology. Have you gotten involved with any of the groups here, like the VFW, anything? Like I haven't gotten involved in any of the, the legions or the VFWs or any of the post. Um, I am a member of the All Cincinnati, um, All American Airborne chapter. Um, I don't attend meetings frequently. It's, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. And I know it. I mean, I know a lot of us veterans need to get involved in, in more of that because if not, we're not going to have, you know, people have support or care about, you know, the veterans. Um, so. I mean, I, I would like to get in it. I'm going to the more, you know, as I get older and stuff. Um, All right, in closing, Jason, is there anything else you'd like to say for the, the public watching this, maybe years from now? Anything about serving your time that you appreciate it? I just, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was six years of, of, of good friends. Um, I'm still friends with a, a lot of the guys. Um, we, some of them were in my wedding. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll hold up a, a picture. This was my main team in Iraq. Um, I'm up here. Cool, good-looking young guy right there. <laughs> um, but uh, this is a great group of guys. I still keep in touch with them, you know, by email and phone and stuff. Um, we'll get to see them. I go to, you know, the uh, uh, 82nd All Airborne uh, reunion that they have every year. It's a huge reunion where you get to meet, you know, uh, paratroopers from World War II um, up to current. Um, but no, the the military gave me a lot. I mean, it, it gave me. I learned a lot about myself. Um, uh, I believe that it, you know, it's going to make me a better civilian, um, better father, better leader, um, better in business, and then just what it offered me. I mean, like, there's no way I could have paid for college without it. Um, and then in closing, too, uh, I just want to thank you guys for thank doing you. the Veterans History Project. I mean, this is great. Uh, I'd, 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 I'm going to go out and try to recruit <laughs> recruit some guys to, to come in here and do this for you guys. So thank you for your service. So thank country. you. All that stuff was, but yeah. but no flooding or anything. Yeah. I'm like, well, if you're gonna buy in a, <laughs> no. <laughs> they Why'd asked you guys me that, if, that day. They asked me if I was. Uh... Are they still local? No, they're in Florida. <laughs> yeah. They used to own a lot of farms out there off of South 133. Yep, that's my oldest. Where are you going hunting? A lot of people do, it seems like.